We spend more money on health care than any other developed country that we're competing with for jobs and economic opportunity, any of them, by far. Our infant mortality deaths rates are higher than theirs are. Our life expectancy is lower than theirs. Our outcomes are not as good as theirs are. But we're just spending tons of loot. So if we can get the technology right, which I believe Vital is on track to do and we're making great progress, so that we can actually carefully have the data that will allow us to move to better outcomes for less money, we all win. So that's why this summit is so critically important. That's why the work that you're doing at Vital is so critically important. That's why I and others are going to support you all the way. You recently posted your 10-year vision for achieving interoperable health IT. You had a, a number of states down uh, within the last couple of weeks, I think. I know Vermont went. I know a member of uh, Vital team went. Does that mean interoperability is your top priority? or? Yes. Okay. And, <laughs> it, and I'll just stop there. And, and, and let me, you know, interoperability is two things. It's a means to an end, and it's a tie that binds. Mm -hmm. So it's a means to an end in the sense that um, what we're trying to do is see that the data is there when, when and where it matters most mm -hmm. for the people we're here to serve, and um, that it's available for the use cases that we want. It is, um, whether that's science or public health or or care or consumers' mm -hmm. engagement and a host of other opportunities. It's also, I think, a tie that binds in the sense that there, there has to be data to share and mm -hmm. uh, to, to, to get to put in motion. And so that requires that we get adoption right. It requires that we, um, we really put the pedal to the metal on um, expanding the types of providers who are in beyond meaningful use and um, making the systems more usable on the front line so mm -hmm. that it's um, really enabling workflow and not uh, inhibiting it in any way. And then, of course, that we set some expectations about governance, et cetera, and mm -hmm. how we're going to entrust the data to whom and, and how we'll handle it if someone violates that trust. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Where can you expect us to be over the next 12 months? Three additional new capabilities, a couple of, uh, that I have alluded to already, vital access, vital notify, and connectivity with New York. First, as mentioned, the centerpiece of this year's summit, vital access, a core capability that gives providers a window into the VHI. We were live as of last week in Rainbow Pediatrics in Middlebury, and we will continue to start rolling out vital access across the state. We will concentrate on the pilot sites that are geographically dispersed and offer the provision of care in different care settings. We will concentrate on providers that share a common population of patients with those pilots as we go into October and November. And then December, we'll be rolling out vital access on a statewide basis. Another new service that is currently being planned, Vital Notify. This is also funded by the State Innovation Model Grant. It's a capability that allows providers to be electronically alerted when there's an admission, discharge, or transfer from an acute care facility. While initiated as part of that grant funding by the accountable care organizations, it's a service that will be offered to all licensed providers in Vermont and New York. So a gateway to the Health Information Exchange of New York, or HICSNY. Those of you that perhaps were here yesterday evening and were able to listen to a panel, HICSNY was a part of that, along with several other HIEs. As an HIE that receives data from healthcare providers in upstate New York, we expect to provide bi-directional access for healthcare providers working with Vital in Vermont and HICSNY in New York. I think you should look into Vital Access. See if her data is in there. Okay, I'll log in. Um, have you seen how this Vital Access works? No, I haven't. Uh, do you have a minute? Um, I think we can find out some uh, significant information. Well, yes, I have all the time in the world. <laughs> <laughs>
Actually, she's stable, and Mary's with her, so I have a minute. Okay, now I can search for, um, what's her name again? <laughs> Sally Wagner, D.O.B. 10-2-1941. Ah, there she is. Hopefully she has signed consent so I can see her information. Uh, this isn't what I'd call life-threatening emergency, so if she hasn't given consent, I can't view her uh, access or data. Okay, here it is. She has signed consent, and so I, can, I now have access to her problem list. She has chronic AFib and type 2 diabetes. No wonder her sugar was low. Her last HbA1c was 9.3, so it doesn't look like she's very well controlled. She was last seen at Grace Cottage for a fall about two months ago, and they were concerned about worsening osteoporosis and had recommended a follow-up bone scan. All right. Here is her uh, recent med list. She is taking oral meds for glycemic control and Xarelto for chronic AFib. Oh, we should make sure to put a PT, PTINR on her labs. Okay, I'll generate a summary document through Vital Access. This will give us an overall medical picture of her history and recent lab work and also radiology reports. Okay. I'll download this and print it. I decided to get engaged and do everything I could. It was like game on. An amazing thing happened then. As soon as the biopsy confirmed that it was kidney cancer, my doctor prescribed a patient community. Within the first two hours after my posting my first note, people said things that no doctor ever says, like, you know, welcome to the community, uh, it's, uh, nobody wants to be here, and we immediately started discussing how likely am I to die. Within the first two hours, people said, this is an uncommon disease, get to a hospital, it does a lot of cases. There's no cure, but high-dose interleukin sometimes works. It usually doesn't, but when it does, about half the time, it's complete and permanent. Voila, seven and a half years later. Right? The side effects are severe. They can kill you. That's why you've got to get to a specialist hospital. Don't let them give you anything else first because it reduces the chances that interleukin will work. And here are four doctors in your area who do it. And one of them was at my hospital. And their phone numbers, by the way. This information does not exist in the literature. This is a new kind of value oriented around what patients find important that does not replace the literature, it adds to it. Something new has happened. Question from the audience. Um, I'm very interested in how the panelists would assess the level of interoperability with mental health care providers. And how is that going? I'd love to hear um, how you're handling that. Here in Vermont, we've started to undertake um, a look at, you know, we actually went to Rhode Island and said, what did you guys do? <laughs> um, and um, realized that several of the things they're doing there might be able to be applicable here. So that's the good news. And several would not work here, you know, and that's probably also really common when you're out on the edge of this kind of stuff is that, um, you know, the laws in the state, the, where the providers are, and some of the way we've implemented consent um, will raise some questions about how we implement the system. Um, but we didn't find any tremendous technical challenges yet. I mean, I mean, at least put it this way, we think we can do everything we need to from a technical perspective. Um, but there's lots and lots of operational challenges with making it work and some policy related ones and um, and adoption. And um, it took us quite a while actually to get everybody to agree that the Rhode Island approach was okay. Uh, there's, it isn't perfect and if you want to know the details I'd be happy to, to talk to you about what we've done and what we haven't been able to do. Uh, what Basically what we do is move data from a community mental health organization to uh, current care and then outbound from current care to providers. And in the course of doing that, there are some consents. There needs to be a consent at the source level to allow us to even, or to allow the, the um, mental health organization 
to release their data to the HIE, and then there has to be a second consent at the HIE level to allow us to collect the data and send it out to whoever you uh, approve. <laughs>